I am Malala, Chapter 19, Good News at Last. One day in October 2011, my father called me over to show me an email he had received. I could scarcely believe what it said. I had been nominated for the International Peace Prize of Kids' Rights, a children's advocacy group based in Amsterdam. My name had been put forward by Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, one of my father's greatest heroes because of his fight against apartheid. Then another email arrived. I was invited to speak at a conference on education in Lahore. The chief minister there was starting a network a new network of schools all the children would receive laptop computers he was awarding cash prizes to children all over his province who had who had did well on their exam who did well on their exam and to my surprise, he was also giving me an award for my campaign for girls' rights. I wore my favorite pink shalwar kameez to the event and decided that I would tell everyone about how my friends and I in the girls' high school had defied the Taliban's edict and continued going to school secretly. I wanted children everywhere to appreciate their education, so I said now I knew firsthand the suffering of millions of children who were deprived of an education. But, I told the audience, the girls of SWAT were and are not afraid of anyone. I had barely been home a week when one of my friends burst into class one day and announced that I'd won another prize. The government had awarded me Pakistan's first na- first national peace prize. I couldn't believe it. So many journalists descended on our school that day. It was a madhouse. I still hadn't grown an inch by the date of the award ceremony, but, but I was determined to be seen as authoritative nonetheless. When the prime minister presented me with the award, I presented him with a list of demands, including a request that he rebuild the school's destroyed by Fazlullah and that the government established a girls' university in SWAT. That sealed my determination to become a politician so I could take action and not just ask for help from others. When it was announced that the prize would be awarded annually and be named the Malala Prize in my honor, I noticed a frown on my father's face. In our country's tradition, we don't honor people in this way while they are alive, only after they have died. He was a bit superstitious and thought it was a bad omen. My brothers, of course, kept me humble. They still fought with me and teased me and wrestled with me for the TV remote. I may have been getting attention from around the world, but I was still the same old Malala to them. I wondered, though, how my friends would take all of this publicity. We were a very competitive group after all, and of course there were there were always Manibo's feelings to consider. I worried that she'd think I'd abandon her during my travels or that she had taken that she had taken up with a new best friend. But there was no time to think about this as my first day back to school. When I arrived, I was told that a group of journalists were waiting to interview me. When I entered the room, I saw all my school friends gather around a cake, shouting, Surprise! They had taken up a collection and bought a white cake with chocolate icing that read, Success Forever. My dear friends, they were a gener- as generous as they could be and only wanted to share my success. I knew in my heart that any one of us could achieve what I had. I was lucky that I had parents who encouraged me despite the fear we all felt. Now, you can get back to your schoolwork, Madam Marion said as we finished our cake. Exams in March.